Hi, I'm William Parkinson at the 40th and Allen Museum here in Essex. We'll give you a quick tour of the museum. The fort came in, they started construction in 1892. The first soldiers arrived in 1893. And basically the reason it is here and the way we got it was we had a powerful senator, Redfield Proctor from Southern Vermont. And he was the head of military appropriations in the Senate. He had been secretary of war under Benjamin Harrison and he had served in the Civil War. So he had a strong military background. And like any good senator, he wanted to bring something back to his home state. And so he tried for years and years to get a training base, a military base, brought here to Vermont. And finally he did, and construction started, and the first soldiers arrived in the fall of 1893. We're at the Essex End, which is the railhead of the fort. When the federal government passed the bill to allow a fort to be built in Vermont, they specified that it had to be on a railroad line between Burlington and Canada, and it had the land for it had to be donated to the federal government for free. So William Seward Webb of the Webb Estate in Shelburne owned Central Vermont Railroad, and he decided he wanted it to be on his railroad. And so he got together with some Burlington businessmen, and they bought 600 acres, which is what the federal government required, to do the base here, and so they started the base here. One of the things that we were very lucky about in this area of Vermont is we had a famous photographer named L.L. L. McAllister who specialized in panoramic photos. And he did a whole series of panoramic photos on the fort, and he would do the legislature every year. He would do school classes often. Anywhere where he could get a big group of people together, he would try to do panoramic photos to sell. One of the things that's interesting about McAllister is that with all of these photos, these are all done what is called contact prints, which means his negative is the same size as the print. He did not even own an enlarger, so that when McAllister did a print, he put the negative on top of the photosensitive paper, and then instead of having an enlarger shoot light through the negative, he actually literally turned on the light in the room, and it exposed the paper underneath the negative directly on the paper. And the nice thing about that is it gives a wonderful quality to the picture. There is no enlargement loss in his pictures. And so there is a big historical record that we have of the post because of having McAllister here. The museum's been here for about 20 years. They're just constantly growing numbers of things. I probably spend two hours a day looking for things from the fort, from the internet and other places. And when you look at the collections in the museum, when you look around the museum, probably over 95% of it came from out of state. I think what happened was the same way we in Vermont now look at our fall foliage and look at our beautiful Camel's Hump and Mount Mansfield and sort of take them for granted. I think the same thing was true in terms of the fort. The people who were here, well, it was just the base that was down the road. It was the people who came and left that took home souvenirs. And so one of our efforts here is to bring back to Vermont all of the things that left over the years. When the base was first opened, it was cavalry. It was cavalry base. It was a training base. And you had cavalry here for about 10 years, and then they added field artillery. Field artillery came in in the early 1900s, and the base then became a combination of cavalry and field artillery. So who were some of the first soldiers that were stationed here? The first soldiers that came in were the 3rd third, third Cavalry. 3rd third Cavalry came in in the beginning and were here for a few years. Then they were replaced by the 2nd. The 3rd came back. One of the most famous groups was here from 1909 to 1913, and that was the all-black Buffalo Soldiers. All the enlisted men were black, all of the officers were white, and they were here for just over three years, and it caused a little bit of a stir in some parts of Vermont that all of a sudden a state that had virtually no black population was suddenly getting a couple thousand black people imported, but they turned out, it worked out just as nice as any of the other troops had been, and there were no big problems because it was black. There had been talk, a few of the Burlington newspapers had proposed that we should have Jim Crow type things, we should have separate restaurants, they should be sitting in the back of the trolley and the buses and that kind of thing. That kind of thing never happened. We never did that in Vermont and it never caused a problem that we didn't. They, when they left, people said that they had been just as good as any of the other troops that had come. Do we have any photos here of the Buffalo Soldiers? The Buffalo Soldiers section, unfortunately, McAllister hadn't started to do panoramics when they were here. But we do have Buffalo Soldier photos here. This one, I love this one. That was the Buffalo Soldier Band. 
That one's got the Buffalo Soldier with all their instruments. Bands were a real big thing back in the early 1900s. When you think about social events in the 1900s, if you were a Vermonter, the biggest thing of the year was probably the county fairs. And the Buffalo Soldiers and the other troops that were here, the regiment, other regiments, they would all go and the bands would perform at the um, county fairs. They would perform at big events. And depending on which regiment was here, a lot of the regiments every single Saturday would invite the local people in and they would do an exhibition on the parade grounds at the gazebo. They would do fancy trick riding, they would do shooting, and the band would play. Um, we even from 40th and Allen, for a few of the presidential inaugurations, our band went down and the band tended to play all over. The, um, the band had its own quarters. There was a special building that was the band quarters. They even had a special stables for the band horses. Band, band was a big deal here. It, when I first came and first started to do the history here, it was just my assumption that if you had a trumpet player in Troop L in one of the barracks and Troop H in another barrack had a good player of the flute, that they got together once a week and practiced and that was the army band. No, that wasn't the case. The band had their own living quarters and the band was basically banned all day long. They practiced, they worked, and they went on exhibitions. And if you were in the band, that's what you were. You weren't, it wasn't a secondary thing, it was the primary thing. So being it was the cavalry, there must have been quite a few horses stationed here as well. With the, with the cavalry here, they, they expected, they built it for 2,000 for 2, horses. And when um, the back row is, is the stables row, and the horses were well treated. There is a horse hospital. There, the stables were individual stalls for the horses, and there are two sets of stables. If you're here on base and you've noticed, the, at the Essex end of the fort, the stables are sort of shoebox shaped, two story. The second story was Halos. And then at the Colchester side of the fort, the stables tend to branch out and they're much wider at the base. The Colchester side is the field artillery stables. Field artillery came into the fort in the early 1900s and were added to cavalry. And the stables at the Essex end, that those were cavalry, they were for 75 horses per building. And at the other end, it was 120 horses per building for the field artillery stables. And in the field artillery, you had two kinds of horses. You had the horses for riding, but you also had the horses for pulling the cannon and the caisson. So you had draft horses in both. There is a cute story that was in the free press in 19, I think it was 1914. There was a horse here, the oldest horse on base, his name was Old Bill. And Old Bill was in the stables and the stable sergeant came in one morning and Old Bill wasn't there. And he panicked, he was all upset and he's looking all over for Old Bill. Well, finally, he hears some noise in the hayloft upstairs and he rushes upstairs. Old Bill was upstairs in the hayloft eating hay. Well, the only way you got from downstairs to upstairs was a spiral circular staircase. And Old Bill somehow had had the guts, or was hungry enough, and he had gone up this spiral staircase up into the second story loft. Well, they tried and they tried and they got a whole group of people there trying to get Old Bill to go down those stairs and there was just no way Old Bill was going down those stairs. But if you were a cavalry horse, you learned how to be thrown so that your rider could hide behind you if you were in a shooting situation. And so they threw old Bill like he was trained to do, and then they tied all of his feet together, and then they lowered him down by the hay lifting pulley in the front of the thing back down to the ground. Wow. So that, that, that's our famous horse story here at the fort. General Harmon from World War II was stationed here right out of, um, right out of West Point. It was his first station. He was a lieutenant at the time, and we were a training base, so he was training the enlisted men in cavalry. And the interesting story from General Harmon was he was training his guys and they were training in the indoor riding arena, which is now Ellie Long. If you've been in Ellie Long, it's a gorgeous building, wonderful inside. But if you picture it back then, it was dirt floor, all one room. You just rode in it. Well, Gen Lieutenant Harmon at that point was training his guys and they were getting antsy and they were tired of going around in circles inside. And so they convinced Lieutenant Harmon to let them go outside. They had a course out behind the, um, behind the building and beside the animal hospital in the back of the fort. 
and they, they wanted to go outside. So they, he said, okay, and he took them outside. Well, they were racing around, having a lot of fun outside, but they took a corner too fast and collided with each other, and about four or five of the men ended up in the um, infirmary. Well, poor Lieutenant Harmon, right out of West Point, his first assignment here, and he's got five of his guys in the hospital doing something they weren't really supposed to do. He goes up to the commanding officer's office, and the commanding officer sits him down and starts talking to him about what happened. And he's all worried he's going to get demoted or huge fine or something. And the commanding officer looks at him and says, well, since none of the her horses were hurt, I'm just going to give you an oral reprimand. If any of the horses had been hurt, you'd be in big trouble because horses to the cavalry are like miner's gold is to a miner. And he got off because his guys were in the hospital, but his horses weren't hurt. But that shows you the value of horses here. The other, other thing that's sort of fun that shows you the value of horses is when I first came in here, Officers Row, those beautiful brick buildings in the front of the fort, three of them are not duplexes. The rest are, are duplexes, are other buildings. And I would have just assumed that the single family housing went to the post commander, the number two officer and the number three officer. That just would have seemed logical to me. But in reality, the post commander got one. It was usually called the colonel's house because we usually were, usually had a colonel as our post commander. But the other two, it wasn't the number two officer and the number three officer. It was the chief medical surgeon and the chief veterinary doctor. So if you were the number two officer, you were in housing underneath the horse doctor. But those, those were the officers and how they played out on officer's role. One of the important landmarks of the fort in Essex is the water tower. The water tower is built in 1893. The total height from the grade to up to the peak of the thing is 96 feet tall. The outside marble, it's white marble, it's called Sutherland Falls Marble, which actually came from Proctor's Vermont Marble Company down in southern Vermont. Remember, Proctor was the one who brought the fort to us. Down at the bottom, when you look at that door, those walls are literally four feet thick. By the time you get to the top, the walls are only two feet thick, but it's four foot of stone at the bottom. The tank itself in the middle, it's a steel riveted tank in the middle of the tower. In this picture, you see the stone tower, and right beside it, you see one of the more modern steel towers built in 1906. So what are the hours of the museum? The museum at this point, after COVID, the museum is basically open when we're here. Now we're here almost every day um, between mid-morning and mid-afternoon. So the museum hours are usually around 10.30 to 2.30 if we're here. If, if someone is coming from a distance, we always encourage them to call first. The number would be 802-238-7813. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and the museum with us. You are very welcome. We're happy to have you.